Hello again, everyone. Vince Lau coming at you from uh, Western University Critical Care uh, with another point of ca uh, care ultrasound uh, hemodynamic series case. Uh, the cases from here on out will hopefully be uh, more interesting with increasing level of difficulty in terms of the ultrasound findings and the hemodynamics that are associated with it. Uh, we'll be delving into advanced hemodynamics uh, with an emphasis also on valvular lesions, stroke volume determination, and overall hemodynamic management for these complex cases. So let's begin with a case on uh, calcium channel blocker overdose. Again, visit the westernsono.ca website primer uh, for stroke volume determination how-to before delving further into the series. So this is a case of a gentleman who has a suicide attempt and he overdoses uh, approximately six hours ago uh, on diltiazem, extended release, 300 milligrams times 20 tabs. Uh, he, we are unable to decontaminate at this time for uh, gastric lavage or anything otherwise uh, through his gut given the uh, ingestion that was uh, six hours ago. His uh, blood pressure is 60 on 40, heart rate uh, sinus bradycardia at 35 to 40, satting 98 on room air, rest rate 20, and uh, temperature otherwise afebrile. So he's admitted to the ICU for a calcium channel blocker overdose. He's placed on pressors and inotropes of norepinephrine of 30 mics per min, epinephrine of 30 mics per min, and vasopressin of 2.4 units per min. Despite this, he has ongoing bradycardia, the heart rate in the 55 range, blood pressure, which is uh, 80 over 60, ongoing hypotension, and he starts to worsen clinically, uh, also with an AKI creatinine up to 100, decreased urine output, and uh, because of the high epinephrine lactogenesis with a lactate of 13.6, which is still rising. Uh, poison control center has been called, and they suggested high-dose insulin infusion and lipid rescue at this time. But is there anything we can optimize in terms of hemodynamics and the vasopressors and inotropes of the patients currently on? Uh, is this primarily just isolated vasodilatory and distributive shock from the diltiazem? Or is there a cardiogenic component knowing that diltiazem is a negative inotrope causing the bradycardia and possibly uh, plus or minus uh, reduced contractility and decreased LV function? And is there any role for any further fluids in terms of volume assessment? So getting to the images... We see here primarily, again, a A-line pattern uh, in keeping with dry lungs with no B-lines and uh, otherwise a sliding lung here. And this is found throughout the lung fields bilaterally. The patient also has in the uh, lower costal as well as plaps views bilaterally, no consolidation, uh, curtain sign otherwise, and no pleural effusions. And again, we know a A-line pattern predicts a uh, dry lung. So getting to the echo itself. We see a quite hyperdynamic LV here in this view. There might be a trace pericardial fusion around, not completely circumferential, but very hyperdynamic LV. And we throw a color across. We see a lot of aliasing, which is uh, blue and red together, but no ev obvious MR and no obvious uh, other valvular abnormalities at this time. Getting to a subcostal view, we see again hyperdynamic left side as well as RV in keeping with overall hyperdynamicism from epinephrine. And we get a subcostal short axis view here, mostly at the mitral valve level, but again we see otherwise a hyperdynamic LV in this view. So we have a look at the IVC. Again, the patient is not intubated at this time when we see respiratory variation on this IVC. And this measures out also an M mode for uh, between 1.77 and 2.13 centimeters. Again, getting to the apical five chambers, uh, we see hyperdynamic LV. RV looks pretty snappy as well. And we throw a color across. There's no obvious AI here, but lots of aliasing across the LVOT. And we'll do our pulse wave uh, Doppler. Uh, we have an LVOT diameter of 1.97 centimeters. And we do our pulse wave Doppler across the LVOT. And we notice that we have a supernormal VTI. Uh, again, upper limit of normal would be 20, and uh, it's 30.4 centimeters. Uh, with this heart rate and LVOT diameter, though, we only have a cardiac output of 5.1. So again, putting this into the calculation for volume of a cylinder, we get a stroke volume of 92.7 cc's per beat, which is quite high, higher than the normal we would expect at 60. So again, the cardiac output is only 5.1 uh, liters per min. So given a super normal stroke volume, we know that the bradycardia is actually primarily driving a, a relatively low or normal cardiac output in this patient. So based on the hemodynamic information, what can we optimize for this patient? So we know that the patient's on norepinephrine of 30 mics per min and vaso of uh, 2.4 units per min. Uh, so that is helping to maintain the current patient's current blood pressure. But is there anything we can uh, optimize in terms of cardiac output? 
So we know that the patient has a A-line pattern, which could accept further fluids in terms of her dry lungs. In her IVC, although normal in size at 1.7 centimeters, that uh, there is respiratory variation on it. So uh, preloading with uh, IV fluids could uh, be tried in this patient. In terms of uh, the hypercontractility and the supernormal VTI and stroke volume in this patient, weaning down the epinephrine could be proven given that the patient's also on an insulin uh, high dose infusion uh, for inotropy in a calcium channel blocker overdose. The lactogenesis that comes from the epinephrine could also be uh, mitigated by weaning down the epinephrine. But we, uh, we know that we don't want to lose any chronotropy that's provided by the epinephrine. So is there any other agents that we can use to uh, swap out? And we do have isoproteranone, which is a purely beta-1 agonist with no uh, alpha effects, uh, which could increase the heart rate or at least maintain it uh, to maintain the cardiac output. So in terms of our recommended uh, actions, we had suggested IV fluids for a further volume resuscitation to swap out a chronotropic agent uh, as isoproteranol to increase the heart rate and then wean down the epinephrine for the supernormal stroke volume and also to decrease the lactate production uh, from uh, peripheral vasoconstriction and for hypotensive management to continue on the norepinephrine and vasopressin. So in terms of case summary, this gentleman from the calcium channel blocker overdose from a suicide attempt was started on isoproteranol, did well from from a chronotropic standpoint and actually increased his heart rate to maintain uh, an increased cardiac output. In terms of inotropy, the high dose insulin infusion was uh, initiated and uh, continued and the patient was weaned off epinephrine uh, with a lower overall stroke volume and uh, decreasing lactate as well from uh, decreased epinephrine lactogenesis. An intralipid rescue was sought after in regards to a lipid sink for the remaining calcium channel uh, blocker uh, in the patient system, which worked quite well. And despite all the hemodynamic instability for this patient, the patient did survive, was weaned off all inotropes and vasopressors, and was DC'd from the ICU from his calcium channel blocker overdose to outpatient psychiatry. So a good end to the case. Uh, the hemodynamics uh, that were uh, acquired from the POCUS ultrasound were definitely invaluable in terms of guiding this patient's management. We look forward to seeing you again for another POCUS hemodynamic series case. Please visit the westernsano.ca website for a primer on stroke volume determination and uh, further cases along the way. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day.